spirit would flow, God, that we would allow you to do what you want to do, God. I just pray that your will would be done. In Jesus' name, amen. I love to sing your praise, Lord. I love the sound of your name. It fills me with peace, washes over me like a sweet gentle rain. I love to sing your praise, Lord. It brings me victory. No matter what I face, through all of my days, I love to sing your praise. Inside of my heart, where a song of thanksgiving starts because of all of your goodness and the joy you give. I will let my song fill the air. Yes, I'll sing it everywhere. Lord, my praise will crescendo every day that I live. I love to sing your praise, Lord. I love the sound of your name. It fills me with peace, washes over me like a sweet gentle rain. I love to sing your praise, Lord. It brings me victory. No matter what I face, through all of my days, I love to sing your praise. Lord, I love to see your sky when you made a glorious sunrise. I love with you in the morning and hearing songbirds sing. But there's nothing sweeter to me than to join in harmony with my brothers and sisters, singing praise to the King. I love to sing your praise, Lord. I love the sound of your name. Oh, it fills me with peace, washes over me like the sweet gentle rain. I love to sing your praise, Lord. It brings me victory. No matter what I face, through all of my days, I love to sing your praise. Lord, I love to see your sky when you paint a glorious sunrise. I love to do in the morning and hearing songbirds sing. But there's nothing sweeter to me than to join in harmony with my brothers and sisters, singing praise to the King. I love to sing your praise, Lord. I love the sound of your name. It fills me with peace, washes over me like a sweet gentle rain. I love to sing your praise, Lord. It brings me victory. No matter what I face, through all of my days, I love to sing your praise. Lift our hands and love the Lord together. We Thank you, Lord. You, Jesus. Praise the name above all names, the one who reigns forever, still the same. Praise the name, Jesus. Name above all names, the one who reigns forever, still the same. Praise the name, no other name that's higher, no other name that's stronger, no other name forever.
no other name can free us, no other name. So precious, I will praise the name. Praise the name of my name, the one who reigns forever, still the same. Praise the name, Jesus, name of my name, the one who reigns forever, still the same. Praise the name, no other name that's higher, no other name that's stronger, no other name forever. So precious, I will praise the name. Every nation, all creation, we proclaim your name. Every nation, all creation, we proclaim.
But let the nation sing it louder Cause nothing has the power to say Like your name It's a strong and mighty power Your name It's a shelter like no other Your name Let the nation sing it louder Cause nothing has the power to say But your name Praise the Lord Thank you Lord Praise the Lord Would you lift your hands and just say the name of Jesus 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 Oh there's something about that name we worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. Worthy, 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 Lord. There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise.
thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name want to say a big thank you uh, for all those that have contributed to helping uh, this family out um, with the wood. I think about 200 and something has come in. 
if I'm not mistaken, 230 maybe. That would sound about right so far. So we almost have enough to get them a cord of wood. And if there's anybody else that wants to get, just um, let us know. We'll put it in the offering. You may do that. Um, or you can give to my wife or Brother Corbin, whatever. Um, whatever suits your fancy, praise the Lord. Amen. I really do feel that God has laid this on our heart. Amen. Not just to keep our, having our hand out for something. But you folks are just so generous and so good at, um, at giving. And uh, every need is, is a great need, really. Um, but especially when it involves um, people staying warm in the wintertime, that's a real great need. Amen? Amen. People have food in their stomach. And I'm thankful for the, uh, those that just reach in uh, without even being asked to just give. There are people here in the church that just give, uh, help one another out. And that's what the Bible uh, requires us to do. Amen. That's Matthew 25, really. Right at the end of the, of the book of Matthew, right before the crucifixion, he talks about um, the nations that help the poor, uh, that visit those that are um, in prison and clothe uh, the naked, feed the hungry. Um, that's, that's really Christianity with shoes on. Amen? That's right. Praise the Lord. We relax and just enjoy the presence of the Lord, and we're ministered to here, but amen. The work really, the service really begins out there when the service ends in here. Amen. amen. Praise the Lord. And I want us to be in prayer uh, tonight uh, for our election, and I almost forgot about that. Thank you, Brother Bond, for mentioning that, reminding me. Um, he is burdened concerning this. You know, it affects education big time. There's so much that they're pushing right now, agendas are being pushed um, through our uh, education um, to literally pervert our young people right. as if they needed any help. Between the media and between popular culture and between peer pressure as though they needed to be uh, convinced that they needed to be um, uh, more active in areas, you know what I'm talking about. I don't need to spell it out tonight. We need to pray. We need to pray for this election tomorrow that God's will will be done. And that righteous people, righteous people, people with common sense will get out and vote, amen? Let's pray right now, I mean that. We're gonna really pray right now. We're gonna pray that God will keep, will protect. I'm telling you, if things go, um, and I'm not, I'm not being partisan here, I'm just saying, this is just, we're talking principle tonight. If things go contrary to the principles of God's word, we are in trouble as a province, amen. Let's pray right now. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we lift up our uh, government, we lift up our political process to you, the voting that's going to take place tomorrow, and there's nothing more powerful, Lord, than a praying people, a praying church, and we take a hold of the horns of the altar right now. We, we plead with you, oh God, for your mercy. We plead with you, oh God, for your hand, O oh Lord, to, to be heavy upon this uh, election taking place tomorrow in our, our beautiful picture province of New Brunswick, Lord. The enemy would love to, to uh, uh, bring in things into our school system that would not be good for our young people, but we pray against it in the name of Jesus. Everybody begin to speak the name of Jesus right now. Let's pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's pray that God's will will be done. We pray that God, you will protect our children, Lord. Most of us, oh God, that have graduated have no idea, Lord, what they face. We don't realize, oh God, uh, unless we have young people that have been in the system, oh God, the, the pressures, oh God, and we pray against the spirit of perversion. We pray against this in the mighty name of Jesus that we take authority. Come on, saints of God. Let's take authority in the name of Jesus. We bind every spirit, every power, every principality that would be working through the system. And we pray, God, your will be done, your kingdom come. Most of all, we pray for revival and a harvest of souls. Hallelujah. We just, we just thank you, God, for what you are doing, oh Lord, and what you're going to do. You are pouring out your spirit and you are drawing in the hungry, oh God. And you are, you are dealing with hearts, oh God, and we're thankful for that, Lord. And we just commit these needs to you tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, John the Baptist got his head cut off for addressing a king and telling him that he had no right to be married to this woman that was his brother's wife. And I believe Herod would have let him go 
but um, for the influence of a few other people that were key people in his life, and he made a rash vow at a feast in front of a lot of people, a lot of witnesses, and he couldn't get out of it. And he ended up having to, to uh, send uh, to the prison and have uh, John the Baptist's head uh, removed and brought in on a silver platter. That was a gruesome end to a feast. And that's in the Bible, amen. But John stood up and how many know that God wants us to speak truth? We've got to speak truth and we need to pray, 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 pray. I'm telling you, it's uh, that we need to pray for our neighbors to the south of us. The election is coming up in just two weeks from Tuesday and pray that the will of God will be done. The Bible says that he that or that force that hinders will hinder until he be taken out of the way. Who's the force that hinders? It's the church. It's righteousness in the earth. Amen. And who is being hindered? It's the Antichrist and his, his agenda for the world. He's not going to be able to do what he wants to do as long as you and I are here. We hold back the powers of darkness. The church in the world. You take the church out of the world today, and I'm telling you, it's going to be like the last six chapters of Revelation. You can read it. That's exactly what's going to happen. The Bible tells us that it's going to be absolute calamity. The Antichrist won't have much to rule over, but a bunch of disaster. Can you say amen? And I believe that's how he's going to get in powers because it's going to be such a crisis that people will fall at his feet and uh, anybody that seems to have the answers. Well, I believe tonight, if ever there were a time when we need to have God speak to us, it is today. We need to learn. And my subject tonight for my message for your consideration is how does God speak to us? Now, first of all, let me say, I believe every one of you have heard the voice of God or you wouldn't be saved tonight because the Bible says that no man can come to God except the Father draw him. And the scripture says they shall all be taught of God. You've heard the gospel and you've been drawn by conviction and that is the voice of God. Many times we think that God's voice is just an audible voice, but God speaks uh, a message to us several different ways. You can get a message from somebody just by looking at their face. Amen. How many know husbands and wives? A message can be conveyed non-verbally. Amen. You can say so much. A picture is worth a thousand words. And so when we think of, of God communicating with us, maybe communication would be a better word because communication takes on various different forms. Communication can be the printed page and I'm thankful for things here. Help me stay on track and remember. Printed page is communication. Amen. Uh, vocal words that are spoken are communication and also impressions Impressions, I should do this or I shouldn't do that. Impressions are also a way that God gives messages to us. I noticed this morning in the service, it thrilled my heart to see people reaching out and praying for one another. Felt an impression from the Lord to do so. That was the voice of God. Amen. And that's one of the ways that God speaks to us. Now let's look at Jeremiah 33 and 3. You should be able to remember that. Jeremiah 33 and 3. 3, 3, colon, 3. You going to remember that one? That's uh, one of my favorites. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. In the ESV, English Standard Verse, it says, Call to me, I will answer you, and will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Aren't you thankful for that verse? How many of you are going to take that and write that out? Put that up on the fridge or print it off on your, off your computer and put that on the fridge. Call unto me, I will answer thee. Show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. So this verse, first of all, the first conclusion that we can draw from this verse is that prayer is the initiator for hearing God's voice. Call unto me, 
I will answer thee. Now, God does initiate conversations, believe me. He does. And he can. And if you're not listening very well, he has ways of getting your attention. How many know that? God has ways of getting our attention. God can initiate. But God wants a relationship that's more than just him talking. He wants a two-way relationship. And when we pray, when we call to the Lord and pray, he has promised he will answer us. And he will show us great and hidden things which we have not known. Uh, again, John 10, 27. Jesus speaking here, John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I want you to see the connection in this verse between hearing the voice and following the Lord. In order to follow the Lord, you've got to hear the voice, amen? And I guarantee you that God speaks to you and I many times and we perceive it not. You're like little Samuel. Eli, surely you called me. It must have been this. And we say, well, it must be my imagination or it must be too much pizza. <laughs> it could be all kinds of things. Eat too much pizza at night. I don't know if that gives you dreams or not, but amen. But it can happen. Job 33 and verse 14. Here's another Job 33 or another 30, chapter 33. So you remember this one, 33 and 14. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, Yet man perceiveth it not. Now in the English Standard Version, I like the way it words it. For God speaks in one way and in two, though man does not perceive it. So let's talk about today the ways that God can speak to us. Amen. Number one, how does God speak to us? Primarily through the scriptures, the writings of his word. I'm glad we have a Bible, aren't you? And I'm glad we live in the day of the printed page. The Old Testament scriptures and all of the New Testament ones were written on manuscripts that were terribly expensive, very difficult to manufacture. And uh, sometimes they were sheepskins or other animals or it could be parchment, but that was a process that was very long and tedious and expensive and time consuming to produce it. And they would write on that. And you know, those old scribes, we're so particular and so meticulous. Anybody here meticulous? Well, I don't know if you'd qualify for a scribe or not because they were meticulous beyond imagination. If they made a mistake, they'd tear it up and start all over again. If they came across the name of Jehovah, they would have a bath before and after writing. They were so, and you know, sometimes the, the name uh, Jehovah occurs several times, even within a verse or within a passage. In fact, wherever you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that's Jehovah. Sometimes it's written out as J-A-H, sometimes it's Yahweh, sometimes it's Jehovah. It just depends on how they transliterate that into English. But um, whenever you see Lord with all four capital letters, it is the Y-H-W-H or Y-H-V-H of Jehovah. They didn't have the vowels, they only had the consonants, and nobody really knew how to pronounce it. They considered it to be so sacred, so holy, that when they wrote it down, they'd take a bath before and after. And can you imagine making, getting all that done and then all those baths, you'd be, you'd be just all, what do they call it when you're all, you know, dishpan hands? <laughs> they were sure clean, those scribes were, weren't they? They were holy men of God, amen. As they wrote out the scriptures and made several copies, Thousands and thousands of copies. Aren't you thankful for that? And you know, it's, it might, you might find it interesting, but back in the 1950s, a uh, Muslim shepherd was out uh, tending the sheep in the desert in the area of uh, Quorum, I believe, in, in Israel. I believe it's not far from the Dead Sea. Very, very dry desert area. And he stumbled across a cave and he was looking for a missing sheep missing lamb, and in there he discovered these pottery um, containers, and inside of them were these old, old, old manuscripts, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. And uh, when they discovered them and we brought them out and looked at them, they were just very, very valuable. It was all kind of just in the plan of God. They were saved there for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And when they compared those old, old, old manuscripts to all the other manuscripts that they had, do you know what they found? absolute confirmation that the word of God had not changed. 
And God saved that for the 1950s because he knew that there would be this, uh, this tremendous criticism against the manuscripts and that there would be a lot of uh, scholars that would be debating as to whether they maintained their integrity and whether they were still like the original or not. And having found those copies that had been in obscurity for all those hundreds and hundreds of years, it only served to confirm that God has preserved his word. Jesus said it. Hallelujah. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Amen. Amen. Jesus said it. Amen. His word when my life is written in the Bible. I'll believe it till I die. Though the mountains pass away. Though the, help me somebody. The be removed. Though the mountains be removed and cast into the sea. God's word shall live forever throughout eternity. Amen. God said his word would never pass away. Jesus said not one jot or one tittle. Now, those were little marks in the Hebrew. And we would say like the dotting of the I or the crossing of the T. Not one little scratch of the, of the ink would be passed away, but God would preserve his word. Aren't you thankful for that? I am. Now, God has exalted his word above his name, he said in, in the scriptures. So God speaks, uh, number one, through the scriptures and the word scriptures and scribes scripture scribe it comes from the same root word that uh, paul tells us as he's writing to timothy in second timothy 3 16 that's a good verse to remember you've got john 3 16 you all know john 3 16 second timothy 3 16 all scripture help me if you know it is given by inspiration of god now what does inspiration mean it means god breathed it means it's more than just God kind of gave somebody an idea. It's like God was breathing into them. God was inspiring them. Amen. Respiration is, is breath. Breathing in and breathing out. Respiration. God gave inspiration or God breathed into these holy men the word. All scripture. Everybody say all scripture. All scripture. We can't pick and choose. Now we call the scriptures the canon. Now there were other books other writings at the same time that the scriptures were written that are not considered inspired of God. They may be good for history. They may be good for reference, but not everything that was written. And the Bible even alludes to the book of Jasher and some other books, but they were referred to, they were mostly just histories of the people of God in the past. But God has seen fit to bring together uh, certain scriptures and God used his people uh, and they preserve that there's a harmony in the scriptures that make it a total unit. Amen. And I don't have time to go into the canon tonight. Maybe sometime we might do a Bible study on that. But that's what uh, the canon is. Those books that are, are, are considered the, to be the holy word of God. Um, now, why has God given us his word? Well, because he wants to communicate. And the first thing we need to do if we want to hear the voice of God is get thoroughly familiar with the word of God. No point in trying to hear a voice or pick up an impression if you don't have anything to measure it by as to whether it's accurate or not. And one of the things they did with the canon of the scriptures is they, 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 the scriptures that harmonized with the truths of other scriptures were included. Amen. And it's just so amazing. It's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle that all fits together. If you look at it, in the very beginning, the first five books, God says, don't add, don't take away. In Revelation, don't add, don't take away. In the center of the Bible, in the book of Psalms, we see this commandment again, not to add to his words. Proverbs, I believe, don't add to his words, lest he reprove thee. Can you say amen? All right, don't fall asleep tonight on my preaching or teaching. <laughs> don't fall asleep on my teaching or I'll get loud here and come down the aisle. It can happen. I've got a cordless mic and I can reach anywhere. <laughs> Somebody say praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. I've mentioned this before, but the Bible begins with the garden. First chapter. It ends with the garden. Amen. And in the very center, well, not in the very center, but you know, in the, in the gospels there, you see Jesus praying in the garden. Amen. And we see the book of Isaiah, 66 divisions that are reflective of the 66 books of the Bible. Verse 39, sound like the Old Testament. Well, 
last 27 sound like the New Testament. In fact, um, the 40th chapter of Isaiah begins with the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Who's that? John the Baptist. And the Gospels begin with that as well. And so we see just a beautiful, beautiful, big picture of the Bible, and then a small picture of the Bible in Isaiah. It just all fits together. And you know what? You can tell what belongs or what, 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 what might not, because it's like if you're putting a puzzle together and you happen to have a piece, sometimes they get mixed up. Isn't that right, sister? Probably you're very organized and keep, Sister Keith, you keep all your puzzles. But you may have sometimes found that there was a missing piece. Isn't that frustrating when you get a puzzle done and there's one missing piece? Has that ever happened to you? It's frustrating, isn't it? All that work and you cannot stand back and say, look, I have completed because no, you haven't completed. If there's one missing piece completely, <laughs> you're not completely finished. Amen. But um, all those pieces have to fit together. And that's the way the word of God is. And that's why one of the reasons why I trust the word of God is because it is so tied together. Now, it's given to us. The Bible says it's profitable. Look at your neighbor and say, you can profit from the word of God. <laughs> Grant's looking for somebody to say hi to. She's gone. <laughs> Feeding the baby. <laughs> and it's, it's profitable for doctrine. Does anybody know what doctrine means? What is doctrine? Well, it simply means teaching. That's what you're getting tonight. It's doctrine. Everybody say, praise God for doctrine. God. Teaching. It's profitable for doctrine. For reproof. For correction, for instruction in righteousness. The doctrine is what to believe. Everybody say what to believe. What to believe. Reproof is what not to believe. God reproves us if we are on uh, the wrong track. Right. Correction. What is correction? It's what not to do. Amen. What is instruction in righteousness? what to do. So we've got doctrine, what to believe, reproof, what not to believe, correction, what not to do, instruction in righteousness, what to do. Amen. Thank God for his word. So God speaks to us through his word. I worked in a bank for a while. It was a very short term. Amen. It was not my area. I love the customers, but it was, I'm telling you, you have to really watch the details when you work in the bank. And we had an old, old dinosaur computer system. It was a DOS. Anybody know what the DOS system was? Anybody old enough to remember DOS? <laughs> Digital operating system? Oh my soul, it was, should have been dinosaur operating system. Because it was, uh, you young people, you, won't, you probably don't know. But it was, uh, do you remember that, dear? She's old enough to know. It's been around forever. <laughs> that old, you had to slip the disc in and whatever. We're back in the original, oh, it was, it was, and we thought we were so high tech. My goodness, we were just on our top of our game, we were. But this old, old system, and it was so easy to make mistakes. And I'll just stop right there and say, I ended up getting a, another job at a call center. <laughs> and I did very good there because all you have to do there is talk. Help people out. Amen. Uh, how did I get out of that? All right, so God has given us his word. And his word, all right, so anyway, the one thing I learned in that, at that uh, bank is that I would take in a counterfeit 50 because I wouldn't have known the difference. I'm telling you, they are so close to the real thing. Now today, we have plastic money. It really is something, isn't it? Used to be you could launder your money, and when I say that, I mean uh, leave it in your pants pocket and it could go through the washer and the dryer. Now you know what happens to a $50 bill, if it goes to the washer and the dryer, it, it just shrinks right up. It's only worth $5 by the time you're done. <laughs> anyway, a 50 came through one day and it was uh, the teller who was standing beside me and she picked it up and she, she knew there was a problem with that. And afterwards we were all examining it and the police was there and he was checking it over. True enough, it was a 50 and she caught it. She had a sharp eye. And they say that the way you get to recognize the counterfeit is by being thoroughly familiar with the real thing. So we don't need to go out studying a lot of false 
ideas out there. Study the truth of God's word and compare everything to what it says. Amen. And so that's why we need to know the Bible. Number one, know your Bible. How does God speak to us? Primarily through the scriptures, the writings of his word. Number two, God speaks through our hearts. The Bible says God takes his word and his spirit takes the pen and writes upon the tablets of our heart. That's what makes the difference between the Old Testament and New Testament. The Old Testament, they had it written in stone. The New Testament, God said, I'm going to literally write my word upon their heart. So they're going to want to do my word because of their conscience. So the second way that God speaks to us is through our conscience. You want to hear the voice of God? Listen to your conscience. That, my friends, is your human spirit. And that is how God communicates. Now, when you're familiar with the word of God, you'll be able to recognize God speaking directly through or to your heart. And as I mentioned before, it comes as an impression. It could come as a thought. It can come as, as a feeling. God can speak through all these ways. But the important thing is God is communicating his message. Now, as I mentioned today, people responded to the Lord and went out and prayed for one another. That's the voice of God. That's where the power of God is in operation. That's the gifts of the Spirit. It really is. Amen. As God lays a burden upon your heart to pray for somebody, always obey the Lord when he tells you, I have woke up so many times in the night, felt to pray for somebody and sent them a message and got a word back from them. And that, Thank you for being sensitive. How many know that if God is moving on you to pray for somebody, there's a reason. There is a reason. And you ought to always give God the benefit of the doubt. That's why I've been able to hear the voice of God. Because I have been taught, give God an opportunity. So God speaks through our hearts. Number three, God speaks through other people. And let me say this. Let me read the scripture first. Hebrews 1 and verse 1 and 2. Hebrews 1 and 1 and 2. Now let's just recap. How does God speak to us? Primarily through his word. He speaks to us through our conscience. And number three, through other people. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God, who at sundry or various times and in various manners, spoke in times past unto the fathers by the Prophets. God speaks to us through other people. Have in these last days, notice he says last days. So the last days began with when Jesus came to the earth. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. God speaks to us through the prophets through the apostles, through the teachers, the evangelists, and the pastors. God speaks through, if we would take the word seriously that we hear and pray about it each week, that God would help us find a way to practice what we have heard, we would become so powerful, so powerful, so powerful in God if we would apply what God has given to us. And many times God has spoken to me through my wife, through other people. Amen. You're not going to get everything directly from God. You're going to get it through his word. You're going to get some directly through your conscience or your spirit. And God is also going to speak to you <coughs> through other people. The Bible says that God will pour out his spirit and upon sons and daughters, they would prophesy. They would prophesy. They would speak under the anointing. They would be speaking to the body of Christ. Amen. And we need to be receptive to the voice of the Lord through the ministries, the ministry in the church and the ministries of the church. Amen. God, God speaks. He does. And then fourthly, God speaks to the writing on the wall. 
God speaks through the writing on the wall. God speaks through circumstances. Can you say amen? In Daniel, the fifth chapter, the first verse, there was this heathen king, Belshazzar, who had no respect for Jehovah God. In fact, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who was king before him, because D Daniel lived through three kings. And Nebuchadnezzar, when he came upon Jerusalem, and he raided the temple. He took the vessels of gold and silver that were there and <clears throat> carried them off with some of the people, some were slaughtered and some were carried off, like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And others were carried to um, Babylon. Excuse me, I gotta grab my water here this morning, this evening. <laughs> and uh, they were they were not a a really spiritual group. They liked the party. They were just living in their Prosperity, And the Bible says in verse 1, Belshazzar, the king made a great feast. It was really a party to a thousand of his lords, and they drank wine before the thousand. And Belshazzar, while he was tasting the wine, commanded to bring the gold and silver vessels, which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and the princess, his wives, and his concubines might drink therein. This disrespect, blatant disregard for the holy. And they brought those golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes and his wives and the concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, brass, iron, wood, and stone. Oh, see the materialism? That's like our day partying and Praising the gods of gold and silver, brass and stone and wood. Amen. Materialism. Just like our generation. They partied and praised and forgot the giver of life. But in the same hour, verse 5, came forth the fingers of a man's hand and rode over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. They couldn't see a body but just the hand. The hand of God. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote, and his countenance was changed. He went from party mode to mourning very quickly. His thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees began to smite one against the other. His knees were knocking. He was so frightened by what he saw. And he cried out, bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. The king spoke and he said to the wise men of Babylon, whoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation there shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled and his countenance was changed in him. And his lords were astonished. Verse 17. Thank God for somebody who could hear from God. Amen. And Daniel answered and said before the king, because he had offered gifts, let thy gifts be to thyself and give thy reward to another. Yet I will read the writing of the king and make known to him the interpretation. Thou, O king, most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty of glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he, would sl he slew, and whom he would he kept alive. And whom he would he set up, and whom he would he put down. But when his heart was lifted up, his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. He was driven from the sons of men. We read this and covered this on Wednesday night. His heart was made like unto the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men. 
and that he appointed over whomsoever he will. And thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. You knew this. You knew the message. You had heard how God had dealt with your father. So you knew what was right and you knew what was wrong. But you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, verse 23, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee and thou and thy lords, thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine. And we know that God does not tolerate disrespect in any form. You praise the gods of silver and gold. How many know that God does not tolerate idolatry? They don't see, they don't hear. And the God in whose hand thy breath is and whose are all thy ways you have glorified. God gave you breath and you have not acknowledged him. Romans 1 21 says, because of when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Then was the part of the hand set from him, and this writing was written, and this is the writing that was written. Mini, mini, tekel, eupharsin. Now, they are weights or units of money. Uh, Daniel goes to the root meaning of the words. Number, weigh, and divide. Number, weigh, and divide. And this was the message. This was the word. Because he didn't listen to what he knew of the word of God and the testimony of others. Daniel was a righteous man. There were other righteous people. And he wasn't listening to his conscience. So God said, I'll use circumstances. I'll write on the wall. Meaning, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel meant weight. You are weighed in the balances and are found wanting. And Paris meaning division. Thy kingdom is divided, given to the Medes and the Persians. And would you believe it? The Bible says that that night, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and it was all over. You know, when God gets to work, and God can move swiftly and execute judgment. God is merciful. I don't doubt that God tried to speak to this man's heart. He'd spoken to his father and Nebuchadnezzar. I don't know how far he got in his faith, but he certainly recognized God and he honored God. And he said, there's a law of anybody speaks against Jehovah God. They will, they will be destroyed. So he became a God-fearing man, but Belshazzar growing up in the lap of luxury and power disregarded all that he was taught and he should have known better. And God said, if you won't listen to your conscience, if you won't listen to the word that you know, because Daniel was a preacher of righteousness. And if you will not listen to others, if you will not listen to your conscience, if you will not listen to the word that you know, then I will use circumstances. And I think it's really serious when God has to use circumstances to speak to us. Amen. God preserved Daniel through it all. And I believe that part of the reason why Daniel was able to withstand all the pressures was that Daniel heard from God. Amen. I don't know what you're facing in your life this week or even today or what you may face next week, but I guarantee you that if you can learn to find consolation and strength in the scriptures. God's principles will work. Amen. The blessing of the Lord. Amen. It will be upon you and I if we stay in the word. And if we listen to our conscience. And if we will listen. If sometimes we can just miss it. God will use somebody else to speak to us. It's only as a last resort that God has to turn to circumstance. And let the hand of God appear and begin to write on the wall. But I tell you, God can. I've seen God speak to me when I wasn't listening and your circumstances. But it's, I would rather just listen to his word first up. Amen. 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 And God blessed Daniel and God raised him up. And you know something? Daniel had, a, Daniel had a, um, an influence. Amen. And we've talked about this just within the last few weeks. But Daniel's influence in Babylon affected for hundreds and hundreds of years because he introduced the book of Jeremiah. He studied. He knew that people were only going to be there for seven years and God was going to bring it back. 
to the land of Israel and restore them. And the temple was going to rebuild. He rebuilt. And, uh, and the Savior was going to come. And he even predicted the day that the Savior would come. And we're going to be covering that in a little while later in, in Daniel on our Wednesday night Bible studies. But, but Daniel had tremendous influence. And uh, in fact, when Jesus was born, the Magi that came, came from this kingdom. They were some of these same magicians, astrologers, and, uh, and the Chaldeans that Daniel was working amongst. And of course, descendants several generations down the line, but the message was passed on. And it was one night they were studying the heavens and they, dis they discovered that there's something happening. There's, there's a new king that's gonna be born. And, and unless, you, unless you think that it's all right to consult astrology, that's not what the Bible is teaching here. Because if you'll notice that um, they followed the star, where did the star lead them to initially? To Herod. Can you say amen? The star led them to Herod. And you know what actually got them to Bethlehem? When they talked to the chief priests. And uh, Herod asked, well, where, where would... Uh, the baby be born. And they said, well, the Bible says. Do you follow me tonight? The Bible says. And what got them back on track? Because they assumed that the king would be born in Jerusalem, the king of Israel. But no, he was born where the Passover lambs were born in Bethlehem, miles away from Jerusalem, where the Passover lambs were raised. And those very shepherds that were watching over their flock by night were no doubt watching over Passover lambs. Can you say praise the Lord? Beautiful picture. Amen. And it was the word of God. When they brought out the scrolls, they said, no, it's Bethlehem, Ephrathah. That's where he used to be born. And the Bible tells us that the, the wise men, the magi, continued on to Bethlehem. And they got to where they needed to. How? Because of the word of God. But that influence of God's word and that influence of that holy man of God, Daniel, affected those magicians and those astrologers so that even generations later, they realized that the king was born. Amen. And I'm not telling you that fortune tellers and astrology and witchcraft, I'm not telling you these things don't work. They do work, but it's from the dark side. It's not of God. But Daniel, even in the midst of that darkness, he was a light that shone. And those wise men did come and worship before Jesus. And I believe that their lives were changed because the Bible says they went home a different way. Amen. They went home a different way. And we'll do the same if we can get into the word of God and, and hear from God tonight, not just tonight, while you're listening to somebody standing behind the pulpit, regardless of who it is. If it's the word of God, it's good. Amen. But you need to hear the word of God yourself. And you need to be in the Bible. The Bible says that deception will be rampant in the last days. Jesus said, take heed. He said that if it were possible, even the very elect. What did he say? Help me. Even the very elect could be deceived. But how are you going to prevent that from happening? By being thoroughly familiar with God's voice in scripture. Amen. And if you and I, if God can speak to your heart from a verse of scripture in your daily devotions, then God can speak to your heart directly and give you the specific information that you need to make decisions in your life that will bring glory to God and blessing upon you and your family. Amen. I really believe that. If we're following the voice of God, it is a voice that will lead us to a place of blessing. Amen. Now, religious spirit won't do that. A religious spirit will only bring trouble. But when the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, he makes us more kind, more loving, more patient. He helps us to know how to handle things with the wisdom of God. Can you stand together with me tonight? Amen. I want us to pray that New Brunswick will hear the voice of the Lord. Amen. That's why we hear. It's because God wants us to be like an amplifier. You know, when the Christian radio station opened up in Fredericton, we were excited. I think the first one that might have come along might have enjoyed FM, still going. Uh, I think it's 
I know you can get it at the top of Snyder Mountain. <laughs> All the way from Fredericton. Snyder Mountain can pick it up. But there for a while, it was just like, if you were within 10 minutes of Fredericton area, you could pick it up. But as soon as you got too far out, one way or the other, heading towards Woodstock or heading towards Sussex or St. John, you, you, you lost the signal. And then I remember them increasing that signal or ramping it up until you could get it like a half hour away. That signal going out there, covering all that radius of area. And then what they did was they, they um, had a, a place set up for one of these stations in Woodstock and they got it through the uh, through online and then they had a little transmitter but it would cover that area pretty good and you could get the radio station there and you could get it in St. Stephen area as well. They had a, a little transmitter because they picked it up and they retransmitted. it. What God wants us to do is be like that. Be transmitters and retransmitters, amen? Sharing God's word. You say, well, I get too shy. I don't know. Listen, I just go as far as I can. Amen. I was sharing with, with uh, a man I'm praying for, you know, about baptism a little bit the other day. And he didn't feel maybe that it was for him, that it was necessary. But I said, well, you just go ahead and do a little research and, you know, let God show you what he has to show you. I just want to let you know that I'm willing to baptize you in Jesus' name. And I'm praying that God will give us an opportunity. Would you say amen? amen. And join with me in faith and and an agreement that, that this man would be baptized. I said, I'll do it publicly or I'll do it privately. It doesn't matter. But um, I just want to let you know that I'm willing to help you out. And you can, you can only go as far as you can go. But amen. Don't do nothing just because you can't lead somebody all the way. Amen. amen. Take them as far as, as they can go. And you'll find that if there's a hunger there, God will show up. And, and you'll, be able to, you'll be able to go further. But God wants us to be transmitters of his word. Amen. Amen. Just want... You know, I think I'm always reminded of the story of those poor lepers outside the city and they were excluded and, and the city of Jerusalem was surrounded or Samaria and uh, surrounded by the enemies and the people were starving inside and finally uh, the enemy was frightened off by the Lord and they left their silver and gold and their garments and their food and everything in the tents surrounding the city where the people of God were locked up inside there and starving to death, dying of thirst. And those lepers, they were so hungry. And they went out and they explored in, in the tents and they found the silver and the gold and, and, uh, and the food. And they were so hungry and they just began to feed themselves. And then they said, you know what? This could be an ambush. They might have just walked off just to, just to, just to trap us. But they thought, well, what have we got to lose? We're lepers, we're gonna die anyway. You know, if they kill us, that just puts us out of our misery. It's not that bad. And then after a while they realize, hey, the enemy's not showing up. This is all our loot. And they said to themselves, they said, you know what? We do not, we're not doing good today. This is a day of good tidings. God has taken care of the enemy. He's driven him out. Oh, I just love to see the Lord do that in Sussex. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you, the liberty we will feel and the power of God will feel and the results that we'll get from very little effort. Amen. When the, when the enemy's driven out, and God can do it just one swoop of his hand. They said, you know, this is a good day. I'm thinking of the word gospel. What does gospel mean? Good news. This is, this is a good time. We've got some good news. And they said, you know what? We better let the, we better let this, the town, the city know that all of this is here. They're in there starving. Or something bad's going to happen to us if we don't shared this news. And so they went to the, and they knocked on the doors and somebody peeked out through the peak hole on that gate and said, what is it? And they said, the enemy's gone. He's gone. He's run off. He's nowhere to be seen. They've left all their silver and their gold and their beautiful garments. And there's all kinds of food. And you know what? You're locked up in that. You're locked up there and you don't need to be locked up. You don't need to be in that prison in that city behind those gates starving and thirsty. You don't need to be that way. God's provided the answer. He's dealt with the enemy. Now, you need to come out. And the, there was one guy there that said, you know, if God were to open up the windows of heaven, how could this ever happen? Because a man of God, I believe it was Elisha, prophesied that the, God's going to do something great and, and, and food's going to be so common that you're going to sell it for a very, very cheap price. And one man that the king relied on, the Bible says he leaned on his arm. He was basically his right-hand man. said, if God was to open up windows of heaven, do you think that could happen? 
And, uh, and the man of God looked at him and he said, you're going to see it with your eyes, but you're not going to taste anything because of your unbelief. And the scripture said they opened up the doors and the people came, they came flooding out and he got trampled. That man that the king, uh, that was the right hand man of the king, he got trampled to death in the stampede as all the hungry people came out of the city and helped themselves. How many know that we need to transmit what we've got? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not an option to be a witness. It's a commandment, go and share, amen. And you cannot uh, force the horse to drink, but you can lead him to the water, amen. Amen, we can be a witness, we can be a testimony. And I believe that the Holy Ghost would love to talk to you and talk to me and say, there's a hungry person right there. There's a hungry person right there. I heard this story, my wife shared this. How many of you ladies were not out to the ladies meeting? All right. Honey, come on up here. She's not expecting this. Come on up. <laughs> she knows what I'm going to ask you to do. I know you had it all written down, but tell us, tell that story about that, that preacher. He was, he was, you're going to be a transmitter tonight. <laughs> uh, there was a minister and he was driving along. He, he worked in a big city. And he was driving to work and uh, as he came was coming up to the stoplight he could see a homeless man standing uh, begging at the light and he said oh god please let me just get through that light i don't have any cash and i don't want to be basically he didn't want to be bothered but as fate would have it he uh, the light turned red and he the man was standing right beside him and so he said i picked up my phone to try to make it look like i was busy and uh, then it came to his mind. He said, I'm going to be like Peter. He said, um, silver and gold I don't have, but I'm going to give him a word. So he rolls the window down and he says, um, um, God has a good plan for you. And he said, <laughs> you tell <him. laughs> uh, he, You're in the palm of God's hand. And uh, the young man just looked at him and he said, my grandfather is a preacher and he always told me that. And so the minister said, would you ever come out to church? And he said, yes, I would. And so he arranged to have um, a, a couple would go to the homeless shelter and pick him up and bring him to church. And as time went on, he uh, was able to get a, a good paying job and uh, his own place to live. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Can you clap to the Lord? He told the homeless man that God had a plan for his life and he was in the palm of God's hand. Then the homeless man said, my, my grandfather was a preacher and he used to tell me those exact words. I heard another story recently of, a, of a, this, this woman felt to tell another woman that, um, and I think I shared this publicly as well on Facebook, uh, that God loved her in any way. It seems so simple and generic, but it was exactly what that woman needed to hear. She said, God, I need to know that you love me and that you're with me. And that woman felt to say those words and to her it seemed so simple, but to that woman, it was the voice of God that she needed to hear. And it turned her life around. So don't ever second guess God. Amen. Give him the benefit of the doubt and say, God, here am I. Just use me, Lord. Speak to me. Because I can guarantee you the harvest is, it's ripe. Amen. And God doesn't need us to be shy. Amen. Like the song says, there's a lion inside of those lungs. Praise the Lord. And we need to, we need to let it out. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your wonderful people tonight that are gathered out and bless those that are out ministering other places. We pray, Lord, that uh, you'll bring us all back together again. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful friendliness of our church today with visitors. I was blessed in my heart, oh God, as I saw how people were reaching out and just being so, uh, so kind and, 
and uh, loving and uh, we're thankful for that and we just thank you God for for even more people that will be coming out and visiting and that you're going to add to our assembly Lord it may be ones and twos here and there but we're believing you Lord for a harvest of hungry hearts that really want to serve you Lord and know you so bless us and give us opportunities Lord and we will be your mouthpiece Lord we want to hear from you this week and we will obey you Lord in Jesus name everybody say amen God bless you for being in the house of the Lord. If there's anybody here that wants to give, uh, just see us uh, following this service. Thank you.